Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. I think... 15% of people probably think that what I'm talking about is just ridiculous and that there's no reason to focus on the soft skills at all. Mm. I'm not trying to reach them. I'm not going to change their minds. Hey, everybody. It's Scott. It's Wednesday, and it's the Pitchworks Podcast. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. This week, I have Dr. Jonathan Winkle, MD. He is across from me here in the studio. And uh, what he's talking about in his book, Healing People, Not Patients, largely has to do with the way medicine is you know practiced and delivered but i can't help but think as i read through this book that what he's really talking about is customer service mindset listening better understanding you know the basis of long-term relationships and you know how it is that you know that you end up with somebody who just keeps coming back to you because you've made the investment in them uh, before we jump into the interview you know that i am going to ask you to rate and review this fine program in itunes because it's how other people find this show and determine whether or not it's good for them so do that for me and uh the next time i see you out and about i will give you the highest of high fives and it's going to be awesome let's talk to jonathan let's find out about uh, you know, customer service, what it is that doctors can do in terms of listening to patients and, and, and developing deeper relationships. All right. Now seated directly across from me, I've got Dr. Jonathan Winkle, the author of the new book, Healing People, Not Patients. Jonathan, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Scott. I, uh, I appreciate you coming into the studio. I feel like we should probably give a shout out to our observer. We've got Marissa Stakely in the studio as well. Just kind of hanging out, you know, learning a little bit about the startup scene. Don't worry, we're not going to force a microphone in front of your face. There, that's a nice smile. We're just going to leave it there. So Jonathan, you wrote a book and to me, it feels an awful lot like just a manual on customer service that literally anyone could pick up. And that's a big reason why I wanted to bring you in here because what you, what you are suggesting is a bit revolutionary maybe for the medical space, but I think everybody could learn from it. Am, am I characterizing you fairly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've often thought of this book as being directed at doctors and patients, but you know, the concept of seeing somebody as the human being, I mean, there's early on, I talk about walking into a Starbucks and looking at the barista and thinking, this isn't just a functionary, this is a person, it's a human being, somebody with a little bit of a divine spark in them. Uh, I mean, we could use that in politics these days, we could certainly use it in sports, we could use it pretty much anywhere. So. Right. Now, when I've spoken to you, and, and, and some of the things I've read, you know, you're very heavily influenced by your faith. Is that fair? Yeah, oh, Absolutely. Early, early on, I talk about the uh, the way different faiths handle that same concept of essential dignity. We all arrive at the same place. So I'm Jewish. I talk about the uh, the idea that in the first chapter of Genesis, we're told that God created human beings in the divine image. Christians read that too. Muslims have their own version of the very same thing. Hindus greet each other by saying namaste. And I looked up the definition after I was saying it enough times because 40% of my patients are Hindu. And it turns out to mean the God within me salutes the God within you. Now, if that isn't the same concept as I'm selling, I don't know what is. How about that? I've heard that word for decades and I never, never knew what it was. Right. So not an authority on uh, on Hinduism or on Sanskrit, but this is a, a recurring definition that I found. And if you look on the website for the Arnold P. Gold Humanism in Medicine Foundation, right? So the trying to talk about dignity of man without talking about God. Yeah. They talk about each human being being an infinitely valuable end unto themselves rather than, you know, a commodity. Well, and and the reason I want to go there first is because um, I think that there are some people who are sort of reflexively uh, going to rule themselves out of anything that they think is proselytizing, anything that they are like thinking is trying to, to rope you in. And this book doesn't do that. I know that. But also... Some people then struggle for, well, where does this idea come from that, you know, Mm -hmm. like all these people need to be treated as though the God within me is, can salute the God within them, the namaste, Mm -hmm. right? And, and I think it's almost beside the point where it comes from. Right. You, okay. I didn't want to hurt your feelings with that. No, no, no. That's fine. It's, 
it matters to me where it comes from for me. But as long as everybody can get on board, like you said, everybody in their tradition has something that says people are people and you have to remember that people are human beings and not treat them in any other way. You don't want to be treated like a thing or like a commodity. Have you, you noticed that we've changed a lot on this subject in the last couple of decades? Have you noticed that the the way businesses and the way mm-hmm. people doing transactions have changed their thought process on this? The the language has definitely changed. Um, everybody wants to be out there as being customer centered, patient centered, you know, person centered, whatever kind of business they're in. Um, you'll see all sorts of signs about it. my favorite sign. I was driving back from Erie at some point and I saw a sign for Shriners Hospital and it's, the sign was uh, turning children back into, uh, t- sorry, turning patients back into children. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Right. And I mean, the Shriners website has that as well. I think pediatrics among all the disciplines of medicine has always been really good at that. They have this whole sub discipline called child life where there's people that walk around carrying, you know, pinwheels and board games and pushing around the video game cart. My daughter Pizza. had her appendix out mm-hmm. and the child life coordinator came around to make sure that yep. those types of things were still happening. Cause she was in for, I think 10 days it mm-hmm. burst. So she was in for the long haul. Oh my. Yeah. That's Everything's a, that's fine. Everything. Everything's fine. <laughs> Take me back to your training. Take me back mm-hmm. to when you went to school to become a doctor. I think a lot of us are intrigued by sort of how do doctors get, what do they tell you to deal with patients? Like, I mean, and, and, and I'll give you a jumping off point. We all remember that Robin Williams movie, the Patch Adams movie, where the stern faced old professor is like, they're not people, they're cases, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, I mean, it's a little too on the nose and in, it, in its attempt. Pun, to, pun intended, I assume. Uh, Patch I, Adams on I, I the wish nose, I were sorry. smart enough for that to be intended. <laughs> but you, I think they portrayed that character in that movie that way because. They needed a cartoonish mock-up, mm-hmm. right? But it still reflected sort of a feeling that people wanted to deal with. And, and I don't know. What, what was it like when you were back there? Yeah. So, I mean, it was unusual, I think, because we were at the forefront of this more humanistic movement, if you want to say, want to say it that way. And I'm, I've, you know, I've read about other, other things coming up at the same time that I was in med school, you know, we're talking about more... Um, person-to-person interaction at UCSF and at other places. I went to Pitt and we actually had a, um, a patient interviewing course that focused on communication techniques and things like that, that was sponsored by a former employer of mine, the Jewish Healthcare Foundation that yeah. I still do some work with and who was a, uh, a major sponsor of getting this book written in the first place. So oh, well, thanks to them, I have to then. give them a shout out. Absolutely. Um, and they've always had this idea that we're looking at um, human dignity and, and so forth. The problem is anything that happens in med school, you've got your explicit curriculum. So you spend the first two years, you've got these wonderful classes on patient interviewing, you know, the biopsychosocial method, uh, psychopathology and society, social determinants of health, all of these things. Where do they put them in the curriculum? They're a couple afternoons a week after lunch. Mm-hmm. And everybody knows what happens when you eat lunch, especially if you eat lunch in a hospital cafeteria, right. you go into a coma from all of the carbs that you've eaten at lunchtime. And so the morning classes were clearly subtly identified as the important ones. The important and the ones, ones that went in the afternoon were the ones that people fell asleep in. The quote unquote soft skills, right? Mm-hmm. This, exactly, the soft skills. Then you get into third and fourth year and there's a hidden curriculum that is driven by the old school attendings that look like the guy in the Patch Adams movie or that are more senior residents that are working 80. Or at the time, I was this was pre-work hour restrictions. So I was a student when... They could still be working 110, 120 hours a week. And all of their frustration got taken out either on the students or on the patients. Right. And so my, my, one of my favorite stories is I'll tell it. I was, I was on a surgery rotation at the VA and it was getting close to midnight. We were on overnight and we stopped off to talk to a guy who had a, a surgery scheduled for the, next, uh, for the next day. And the senior resident, the chief resident goes into the room and sits down to talk to the guy for a little while. And I'm standing out in the hall and the intern turns to me and says, what's he doing sitting down? We're going to be here forever. Ah. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> his curriculum was, I want to get downstairs and eat before something else happens. And the chief, who was one of my favorite residents that I worked under as a, as a med student, is taking his time and talking to this guy and trying to calm him down. Um, so that was the hidden curriculum that the culture was, the longer you stay, the longer you stay. Right. 
If you are on the floor at 4.59 and you hand your sign out and get out by 5, that's great. If you're there at 5.01, you're going to be there at 6.01 or 7.01 because something else is going to happen and you got to get out of there before it does. Interesting. So there's a million potential questions that can spring out of this, right? Mm -hmm. And this was one of the things I was trying to tackle. As I was going through your book and as I was thinking about what it was that is most useful for people to understand. The temptation is to say like, oh, Jonathan, how do I find a doctor that's not gonna treat me like dirt, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Um, And we may even get to that point, but for right now, I wanna leave it at the side of the road. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to talk instead about what you're talking about is a paradigm shift. Change is not necessarily the most welcome thing in any, anywhere, in any business, in any home. Change is not always the most welcome thing, but it feels as though Healthcare is more regimented than most environments. Mm-hmm. So would you say that what you are proposing is met with enthusiasm, with, with some pushback, some combination based on who you're talking to? T- tell me what the, what the reaction is. Yeah. Uh, I th- so there's three reactions. I mean, there's, fi- there's a, the 85-15 rule in medicine works like this. If you don't know the answer to the question, how much of something, the answer is either 85% or 15%. And I think it works this way with, with I'm how terrified by how that came to be. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, you, you didn't, you didn't get honors by using that rule, but you got by <laughs> that's, that's C um, work. Got it. You know, okay. Winkle. Well, you know, how, what percent of people have this microorganism when they have pneumonia? Uh, it must be 15%, right? Yeah. So where this applies to what you asked me is I think. 15% of people probably think that what I'm talking about is just ridiculous and that there's no reason to focus on the soft skills at all. Mm. I'm not trying to reach them. I'm not going to change their minds. 15, That's smart thinking. 15% of people are naturally awesome at this and figure out how to do it without anybody like me having to tell them. Yeah. For the 70% of people in the middle, they have some of these skills. They want to be better at it. They want to practice in an environment where they don't feel like they're rushing through their visits where they don't feel like they are shortchanging the person, where they don't feel like they're leaving really important stuff that's not, quote, purely medical on the table because they don't have time to deal with it, but may not be sure how to do it. I'm still not sure how to do all of it. I mean, this is a work that's written as I'm as I'm learning because we're in a we're in a system that doesn't really allow for a lot of this. Well, but I think that mm -hmm. there's a lot of merit in the in the perspective you write from, which Mm -hmm. is I don't pretend to know everything, but here's what I've seen. Mm hmm. Right, and here's what I've chosen to do with what I've seen. And if you follow me, that's great. Mm-hmm. But if not, I didn't expect Rome to be built in a day. Either, exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, it, it, I think any change is going to be incremental by definition. Mm-hmm. Now, the interesting tidbit, not to insult your intelligence, but the fact that it's so hard for a lot of people to come to grips with this is a lot of people try to close the unclosable. Right. They they go like, no, I have to convince those fifteen percent <laughs> that are never going to come along. Mm-hmm. And I'll just break my back on that effort instead of why don't we focus on the people who kind of feel like they might get it Mm -hmm. and then let them be the example moving forward. Exactly. Those 70% in the middle, um, you know, that's who most people are going to end up seeing. And, you know, my audience is as much the patients as it is the doctors. I I want everybody to be able to, to meet in the middle because it's really a partnership, right? I mean, we, we stand or fall as this. Health is one of the best indicators of how well a society is going to do. If the majority of your population is suffering, I mean, look at what happened to life expectancy and, and economic development in Africa during the AIDS epidemic, mm. right? Things just, things that were really progressing well as decolonization happened and there was lots, all this hope and then, and then that, um, or what's happening now in a lot of rural America as the opioid epidemic is spreading. I mean, we've got life expectancy decreasing for the first, for the first time in time. history for the last two years. But one of the things that's happened historically is that I actually saw a great presentation on this about three, four weeks ago is, you know, early on when morphine was first discovered in the 1800s, uh, when people first started to become addicted to it, the clinicians that, that noticed it were, were heartbroken because they realized that they had caused this problem. Mm-hmm. And at some point within the 30 to 50 years after that, the shift started to happen where the person that became addicted and the source of that addiction disappeared and right. you had the addict. Right. And it's taken us until the last five or 10 years to get back the humanity of these people that are struggling with addiction in order to be able to not 
you know, just sort of throw programs at them or throw them in jail or do whatever. I love you. I, I don't agree. I, I, I don't think that we are where we need to be yet. I still think we treat it as a criminal justice problem oh, instead of oh, a healthcare problem. And, that's absolutely true. And the blame still rests solely mm-hmm. on the user as opposed to the backstory of how they ended up with it, right? Like these mm-hmm. people who started off. And I, the one I point to is Brett Favre, right? Because there are so many people that would go to their graves mm-hmm. defending, you know, their favorite quarterback. And you're like, okay. that's a person who was prescribed painkillers. Right. And now won't take them because mm-hmm. he was in it. He, I mean, he, he got roped into the same addict behavior that you're, you're talking about. Right. So I, I absolutely agree. People are still being treated that way, but the language is starting to appear in public of helping, understanding, caring rather than punishing. Um, and that wasn't, that wasn't true five, 10 years ago regarding opioids. It wasn't true 30 years ago regarding crack cocaine. It wasn't true, you know, reefer madness in the 30s you know that's that that whole mindset of of dehumanizing somebody because of a drug addiction or alcohol at any point in history right now i was at your book release on sunday night Mm -hmm. which unfortunately the nfl decided to flex a steelers (laughs) game over top of it and i mean you know i mean that's a nice venue i mean Mm -hmm. you filled it right and also Hanukkah, like right. on, on top of everything else, right? There were tons of reasons for people to stay home and they didn't, you know, you had somewhere between, I'd say like, I don't know, a hundred and 150 people that were there at your book release. And near as I can tell, you don't have like a ready-made baked in audience. You don't have a series of books that have already come out. Right. You don't have a TV program. You don't have anything else. So how did that happen? It happened for a couple of reasons. First of all, I mean, I'm I'm local. I got a lot of friends and family around, so mm-hmm. people were coming out to be nice. But it happened, I think. We're talking about the Steelers here, Jonathan. <laughs> nice has its boundaries. Right. Yes, nice does have its boundaries. And, and uh, there were a few people who I know didn't come because they were at the game. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jonathan, I'm so sick. <laughs> Maybe that's because you're sitting outside at the stadium. That's right. Um, I think it resonates with people for a bunch of different reasons. And And, you know, there were a bunch of people in that audience. You heard some of the questions at the end who are practicing physicians who who are in that 70% who want to be able to bring that back into their practice but are worried for example that they're going to burn out. Yeah. And they you know they they look at me and say, "Well, Jonathan hasn't burned out yet. Maybe maybe there's hope. Um maybe there's uh maybe there's a way to even with all the constraints that are on me to still you know, spend those couple extra minutes with somebody or ask the right question so that they know that, that I really care and that I'm not just trying to, you know, swipe their insurance card and move <laughs> on. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are, that are working in social services that are, that are seeing what I'm seeing, which is that half the time, nothing that I do in the clinic is going to matter. It's what happens with the job or the child care or the caregiver for their aging parents. That's really going to make a difference. And, and you, the people there that I've partnered with, they know this, they, they breathe this. So I think that's what brought a lot of people out was wanting to celebrate the fact that this is, a, that we, I started talking about it before, right? The community, the partnership between first between the person who's seeking healing and the healer, and then eventually all of the other folks in the medical neighborhood is what we need to kind of benefit everybody in society i'm gonna be horrible for a second ready you should be horrible well i'm good i mean i try not to be but i'm pretty good at it right you had a book release on super on 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 steeler sunday Mm -hmm. right right during a major holiday (laughs) right we did light hanukkah candles i just want to be clear you did light hanukkah candles cancel the holiday we celebrated you were kind enough to share you know Mm -hmm. food and drink with everyone but you added to that Mm -hmm. that you're like oh and by the way i'm gonna play the guitar and sing too right that's almost always a killer (laughs) thank goodness you're good at it right but thank you well it's praise it's hard one i'll tell you that because i mean frankly a lot of times i would have just said nothing and been like no that was okay no it was good but there were a ton of different reasons why people would have stayed home it's Mm -hmm. a book release well i'll just get the book well i'll just watch what happens he doesn't really need me there I'm not that important to his journey, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I am going to go out now and turn what was horrible into a conclusion that I think is favorable, which is I think you resonated with a large group of people, and it's not so much that it was people being nice or you've mm-hmm. just been in town for a long time or, or whatever. And to me, in my nerd chair, 
That's market validation. That says you took a bunch of people that had perfectly good excuses to be elsewhere and mobilized them to come mm -hmm. support a book release that they could have very easily phoned in sick on and nobody would have called them on it, right? right. Mm -hmm. they, they were there because they wanted to be. So kudos to you for that. But it does have, it, it begs a question, which is where does this market validation take you as a next step? Sure. One book becomes two? Mm -hmm. Or is it, Maybe we do some type of media. Is it a business? Tell me, tell me aspirationally where you'd like to go. Yeah, there's a, so there's a few things aspirationally. First of all, um, one of the other things that validated the market was a couple of days later, I was at the, uh, at the practice of a friend who's a chiropractor, um, my friend uh, Gideon Orbach, who works at the Weiner Wellness Center. And uh, he invited me to come over. He had been at the release. He wanted me to come uh, meet some of his patients. And I had two or three people come up to me after. He says, you know, I have a PCP but he doesn't listen. And as it happens, the name of my website is healerswholisten.com. That's right. And, uh, you know, that's, re that's really where it starts. Like chapter one talks about my, the, is, is all the, the Jewish stuff is about how I got into this and, and the vision that I had when I decided that being, a, that I was going to listen to everybody who told me being a rabbi was no job for a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> and that was a good story. I'm glad you shared that at the, at the release party. It's my favorite one. <laughs> it warmed everybody up though. It was a nice way to get the rest right. of the message out. So the second chapter is all about listening, um, you know, and, and the difference between hearing you know, the old Paul Simon thing about hearing without listening. Mm -hmm. This is it was it is about listening, about figuring out how to how to really get the sense of what somebody's saying, not to ignore the important details, not to tell them you don't have time to listen to everything they're saying. And uh, there is a huge population of people out there who feels like they're not getting that treatment, not only from. The doctor that they see, but from the pharmacy, when they say, hey, this, this medicine did something weird to me, are you sure you didn't switch it on me? Or that they're not getting from the front office staff at whatever medical practice that they go to, that they certainly aren't getting from their insurance company, um, with all apologies to my father, the insurance agent. Anyhow, the, um, that population is out there. It's a huge, part of, a huge part of the population who are going to see doctors, which frankly is just about everybody. Although I see mm -hmm. a lot of people who apparently haven't been doing it very much for the last 30 years, because that's one of my favorite opening lines. I haven't been to see a doctor in 20 years. Well, I, I guess I better kick off my shoes. We got a lot to talk about. Yeah. Um, what I want to share with them, I've been, I mean, I've been writing a weekly blog, mm -hmm. uh, which is at healerswholisten.com slash blog. Where I do want to go with this, I want there to be materials that are out there to be accessed by providers who can go in and say, you know, I, I want, I'm in that 70%. Yeah. I don't know what to do. We've got a curriculum that we developed uh, at Jewish Healthcare Foundation as I was writing this book um, that I've started using in the work that I do at Chatham University in the PA program, actually teaching people, you know, here's some language you can use to get the, get the answers you're looking for. Here's some language you can use to validate the things that people have told you. Legitimate to, best practices yeah. that they can just basically <clears throat> crib off of you. Exactly. To set an agenda, to, um, to wrap up and say, Hey, we didn't cover everything today. When are we going to deal with X? When are we going to talk about your toenail fungus? When are we going to talk about your, um, your itchy scalp? You know, all of the things mm -hmm. that fall to the bottom of the list because they came in and saying they had chest pain. You got to deal with that first. Every time you mention one of those, by the way, 10 listeners drop off. I'm, I'm just sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about how to talk about your daughter's graduation from high school. There you know, it you know, is. Yeah. There we go. Come on back. You know, yeah, come on back. I didn't if mean to still mention the gross, We didn't mean it. I didn't mean the gross stuff. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's that for providers. There is, we're looking to create an opportunity for people to, um, to talk about their experiences on, on the seeking side of saying, you know, I went in to the hospital or I went in to see a doctor and, this was really what was bothering me, and we never got there. Mm -hmm. Something happened. Something went wrong. The system screwed me over, or the person wasn't listening, or we ran out of time. Something, something happened that shouldn't have happened, and now I'm stuck without the care that I needed. You know, a couple of the people that bought the book were like, I'm buying this because I know somebody who's going through a really hard time, and I think they'd appreciate having this. I'll go one step further, though, um, and I know that you got into this a little mm -hmm. bit um, in, in the book, but... Anytime you agree to listen to someone very closely, you open yourself up to the potential of being misled. And there are incentives for people to mislead you. Mm -hmm. We don't need to recount all of them. Let's just mention a few. I've decided that I have a certain disease and I'm going to try to talk you into it. Mm -hmm. There's a certain medicine that I want to get my hands on because it's, uh, it's on a schedule, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I really just want to get out of work, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
I think you do a decent job of explaining this in the book, but I want people to understand that it's not, the book doesn't just roll over and say, well, whatever they tell me is just, mm -hmm. you know, accepted as truth. Um, tell me a little bit about the safeguards that you have built into your practice that keeps you from necessarily making a giant mistake by over trusting or over listening. Right. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good point. So, I mean, anybody who's ever tried to get me to prescribe them antibiotics for a cold knows that go. I don't over trust. I wish I would have thought of that one. That's a great yeah. example. <laughs> that's, it's the best example. Um, you know, the best way to do it, and, and this is a listening skill. What is it that they really want? Nobody just decides one day, I think I'm going to try and hoodwink the government out of $701 a month so I don't have to work anymore. Right. You can't live on that money. If you're asking for disability, and I do talk about this in the book, there is a reason why you think that's the only option you have left or that it's the best of a series of bad options that you have left. There are a few people who are trying to get that as 700 extra dollars while they're working under the table. Oh, but yeah. for the most part, the majority of people, it's the best option they have left. Um, and I think our system errs too much in the other direction because I take care of a lot of people who are seriously injured and handicapped and to use a word that's not really in, in uh, currency anymore, but severely disabled of, in one way or another. And they wait two or three years before their disability hearing finally you know, reaches a favorable verdict. So, yeah. So, I mean, the, there's a, a few skills that I talk about in the book and it's things that I want to work on as we're developing this, this brand of healers who listen is the skill of finding out what the real ask is, right? Are they asking for antibiotics because they have to go back to work tomorrow and they want to feel better now, right. which of course isn't going to happen. Or are they asking for antibiotics because that's just the way they've always done it. And they, you know, maybe, maybe don't realize you know, I, I was going to say this with the disability question. You could say it with antibiotics. If you just give somebody what they want, you're not doing them any favors. You're not really listening either. Right. You know, you could say, well, you know, the person who just rubber, rubber stamps everything, they're going to be done a lot faster than somebody who decides to get down in the weeds and roll up their sleeves and, and really take this head on. And this is where it departs from typical business mm -hmm. uh, customer service, because in most cases, just giving them what they want doesn't do any damage to them, mm -hmm. right? Like, no one's worried about the the antibiotics and superbugs in the Verizon call center, right? Like <laughs> right. That's, just give him what he wants. Just mm -hmm. just get him off the phone because time is money and you're costing us a ton, right? Right. And I mean, look if you if you look at it, spending the time up front, it's going to take longer the first time. Mm -hmm. You might end up though not having that person have to call 15 times to say, well, I didn't get this and I didn't get that. And I didn't understand the answer to the question that the doctor gave because he was in too much of a hurry. And she didn't explain how I'm supposed to take this medicine. And I went to the x-ray place and they said they never got the prescription. So taking the extra time up front, like, like in a lot of things, you invest the time, right? The, the old John Wooden quote that I dragged out in, the, in one of the <laughs> chapters toward the end, always be fast, never hurry. <clears throat> you end up, saving time down the line save the person's time also right you send them probably to far fewer specialists for far fewer pointless appointments if you stay with them and say let's let's get to the bottom of this now rather than saying oh i'm out of time why don't i just send you to an ear nose and throat doctor for that earache or why don't i just send you to a dermatologist for that rash mm -hmm. let me take five extra minutes we'll do it now you don't have to go anywhere else and wait two more months until you get there and you're not going to call me again tomorrow and say, Hey, you didn't look at my rash. So that's, that's part of it. Um, the skills that I want people to get and that partially are in the curriculum and that we're going to work on developing are how to really actually get to the, the motivation behind asking the question in the first place. What makes you feel like you're disabled? Why is, you know, why does you, why do you feel like that's the only option? What makes you feel like the antibiotic is going to fix everything? What makes you feel like whatever, like, like the morphine is the only thing that's going to help. Yeah. Those are questions that usually don't get asked at all, but if you ask them and are prepared for the answer, then you might be able to do something. So somebody who just signs the disability form or who just says, I'm not signing that disability form, right? Those are the two extremes. We're in the middle. We're trying to get to an agreed upon solution, a negotiated solution. That's not a negotiation between enemies, but it's. You know, well, it's, it's people a covenant, who, it's partners. Yeah, people who maybe have different mm -hmm. goals and come from a different set of perspectives. Now, right. let's go back to the hard metrics. How much more time per 
let's say per appointment do you think you spend mm -hmm. than, than someone who doesn't follow the same practices? It's hard to track. Um, but I would say, you know, they, they talk about the average internal medicine appointment being something like 16 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's actually been fairly constant the whole time I've been in the medical field from the time I started medical school until recently. The metrics that are the problem are some of the smaller metrics. For example, how long does it ha how long does a patient talk before the doctor interrupts them? And it runs somewhere between 11 and 23 seconds. Right. Right. How long does it actually take for somebody to get everything off their chest at the beginning of an appointment? Say, this is why I'm here. The outside, about two minutes. Mm -hmm. The inside, about six seconds, right? I'm here because I have a hangnail. Right? Well, okay, yeah. But most people aren't going to talk uninterrupted for longer than about two, three minutes. They're going to wait. The, there's going to be an uncomfortable silence and wait for you to ask them some questions or tell you or, or expect that you've figured everything out just from what they said and that you're going to give them the answer. A lot of my... Uh, foreign born patients, especially people who are coming from more rural, underdeveloped areas, that's what they expect. They, you know, if, if they ever got to see a doctor where they were, that's what they, you, you said, told them three things. They said, oh, I see what's wrong with you. Here's some antibiotics. Right. And that was, that was the extent of the visit. Um, to different culture, they, we've been told a lot of times, you know, you American doctors, you ask too many questions. And that is... That is very different. And that's our style. When you have to wait longer to see a professional, mm -hmm. you are more likely just to blurt it out because it's right. become more pressing. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, when you know that you can always walk to a doctor anytime you want and mm -hmm. get what you want, you're a little less forthcoming. You have less of an urgency about right. blurting out your need because it hasn't blossomed into urgency yet. Mm -hmm. This this goes right back to what I'm saying, learning how to ask the right questions. You know, People aren't always going to come out with it. And my experience is that most people actually leave important stuff for the end. Right. Sometimes, you know, they're what, what we call in medical school, we call them doorknob questions because yes. your hand's already on the doorknob and they say, oh, by the way, my chest kind of hurts. I, I, I think the metric about 23 seconds at the outside mm -hmm. to be interrupted runs directly in the face of that finding though, mm -hmm. right? You know, if, if we know there are certain things people are slow to open up about, like mm -hmm. the heart thing, right? I think there are a bunch of people who are wondering if they're being hypochondriacs They've been told that they need to be a little bit tougher. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm too young to worry about that. Or, you know, there's 15 right. different ways you can talk yourself out of asking for help. And again, it's not as though there's a supply problem. Mm -hmm. I, can I can walk to a doctor anytime I want to. Why does today have to be the day? And then you talk yourself out of it. Right. And then the doctor, and I'm going to say this in a way that's probably horrible, but is somewhat complicit in it mm -hmm. with that busy demeanor that just helps to reinforce my attitude that maybe I shouldn't bring this up. Yep. Because I'm, I'm sitting there and it, it goes through my mind. I just fight against it a lot harder than I think I might have when I was training or that, that other people might, it goes through my mind. Oh, he's coming in about this thing. He doesn't really think it's that big of a deal. We'll just watch it and see what happens. Thank God that was a short visit. I can catch up. I'm 15 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 minutes behind <laughs> schedule. Right. I'm going to use this visit to make up the time. But he doesn't really mean that it's not that big of a deal. It means he w doesn't want it to be that big of a deal. Um, we're going to direct people to healerswholisten.com. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think there's some really interesting things that we didn't spoil. Okay. In fact, there's a lot that we didn't spoil mm -hmm. in there. It is called Healing People, Not Patients. It is Dr. Jonathan Winkle. Thank you for coming into the studio. I Thank really you. appreciate your time. All right, that's the end of the show. Thank you to Jonathan for coming in, and uh, thanks to Marissa for coming in here and uh, just basically you know, throwing a keen eye on the operation, make sure everything is running smoothly. Uh, next week, we're going to do another one of these. Make sure you check out Jonathan's book in the meantime, Healing People, Not Patients. It's available now, and uh, I I'm telling you, it's an easy read. You're going to understand what's going on, and I do believe it will help you not just develop better relationships, but longer-lasting relationships with the, the people that you have to take care of in your daily life. We'll catch you next week. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart, LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com. P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.